Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Than from Title Gardens. Today, I'm going to ask and try to answer a simple question: What is the difference between a zoanthid and a paleothoa? It turns out that it's a much muddier topic than it seems. Last year, I met two young ladies from the University of Findlay, Jessica Gordon and Courtney Timmons, who really know a thing or two about zoanthids. They were doing genetic research on zoanthid identification, and I donated several small colonies for their study. Talking with them is what really got me looking much more closely at the issue of identification and taxonomy. In short, the taxonomy of these animals is a mess. Part of the reason taxonomy is all over the place is the fact that a large bulk of early identification of zoanthids and paleothoa. Happened about 50 years before the invention of the light bulb. I'm serious. We're talking about the early 1800s. You can imagine a few changes that have happened since then, and especially considering taxonomy is known to change when new information, pardon the pun, comes to light. The other reason that zoanthid taxonomy is all over the place is the lack of research being conducted. Phylogenetic trees are developed over time by extensive research and scientific debate. Animals like primates, for example, have a great deal more research being conducted, so there's more peer-reviewed scientific publication and a great deal more debate to flesh out a generally accepted consensus. That sheer volume of research is lacking in coral taxonomy. Different identification techniques can yield wildly different phylogenetic trees, and that, in a nutshell, is where we are today. Now that we have some of the background out of the way, is it even possible for hobbyists to identify zoas and pallies? Honestly, probably not in any scientifically valid sense. There are some identifiers that the hobby has latched onto, so we can talk about them. But many of the identifiers actually used in scientific study are out of the reach of most hobbyists. These identifiers involve observing internal parts, such as septa and mesenteries. As well as microscopic details such as the shape and size of nematocysts, not a lot of hobbyists are in a huge hurry to chop up their rastas and look at them under a microscope. Believe it or not, that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem with hobbyists identifying anything is if the observation is happening in a home aquarium, it basically doesn't count. When you're talking about phylogeny, the observation has to be a wild colony in its habitat. Now this is mainly due to the polyps' ability to change dramatically when introduced to a new environment. Regardless, let's go over some of the commonly known characteristics of zoanthids and paleothoa that we can see without a microscope. The first is the length and shape of the tentacles. Zoanthids tend to have smaller, shorter tentacles, but this is one of those gray areas. Paleothoa grandis, for example, is unmistakably a paleothoa. And has some of the shortest tentacles, given the incredible size of the polyp. On the other hand, this paleothoa has extremely long, active tentacles. The second identifier is how the polyp deals with substrate. Some polyps incorporate the substrate directly into their flesh, while others do not. This incorporation of substrate is associated with paleothoa. Take a look at this guy, for example. Those small little flecks that you see on his skin; those are actually little grains of sand. Well, that's a start. So the third thing is, there's a marked difference in the feeding response between paleothoa and zoanthids. Where paleothoa are highly aggressive feeders, zoanthids are kind of more finicky. We very rarely come across foods that zoanthids consume readily. It looks like the next step is to get all CSI and look at genetic research, like the type Jessica and Courtney are pursuing. Now, most of the genetic work is being done in Japan by a researcher by the name of James Reamer. If you're interested in seeing the raw intel, do a search for his publications. Genetic testing is in its early stages. The whole genome isn't fully worked out. So researchers are looking at relatively small segments of DNA and RNA that show high degrees of genetic variation. Now it's really challenging work. You may or may not know this, but genetically, there's less than like five percent difference between humans and chimpanzees. 
it's entirely possible to look at long stretches of DNA from these two species and come up with the conclusion that these two seemingly different animals are the exact same thing. That last 3 to 5% makes a big, big difference. The same sort of thing is happening with zoas and pallies. Much of their genome shows no differences, so depending on which segments of DNA you're comparing, your trees are going to look very different. It's hard to isolate a segment of DNA or RNA that has within it enough diversity to differentiate down to the species level. If you've made it through this whole video, the lesson here is identification is a lot more involved than most hobbyists realize, and there needs to be a great deal more work before anybody has a great understanding of it. But we are getting there. Alright, that's it for me. I'm going to bed. Happy reefing, guys.